Luke chapter 22 and verse 39. And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that you enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Some things that Jesus would not do. God bless you. You may be seated. As you know, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how the Lord was quick to tell us that it must not ever be our will, but his will to be done. Another thing that Jesus would not do, and I told you last week, that he would not allow himself to be removed from worship service. And he did take and attend the worship services of his day. Today we're going to start something else Jesus would not do. He would not compromise the doctrine of baptism. You see, the Word of God is still the Word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away. But Jesus said, my word will not pass away. I've said this many times before. I want to hear what God has to say before man says anything. Everybody's got their ideas. Everybody's got their opinions. Everybody's got their thought patterns. But my ways are not his ways. My thoughts are not his thoughts. So let me hear the word of God before I hear the word of man. Does that make sense? Jesus would not compromise doctrine. No matter what area it was, and here I'm talking specifically of the doctrine of baptism. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 13 says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John, thinking humanly, you know, like you and I, forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. Comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer, in other words, allow it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Baptism enters into that arena of making you righteous. It later places, Jesus said, you must be born of water and of the Spirit. It enters you into the arena of righteousness. Then the Bible said that then John suffered him or allowed him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. We see very clearly that baptism is a critical issue in you and my plan of salvation. The Bible's very clear on it. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 20 says, which sometimes were disobedient, which once the suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Some people say, well, that's, that's a work. That's an action. I don't have time to go into detail. Take it clearly from the word of God. It says straight 
forward. Baptism doth also save us. It plays a part in God's plan for your salvation. It's not an afterthought. It is not a, a formal just reaction letting the congregation know that you're now a member with them of the church. It is having an action in your life. In fact, it's clear. It says not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not a physical thing. But the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Whenever you look at the plan of salvation, it is very simple. It is very straightforward. Simon Peter said, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall be resurrected. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the death, the burial, the resurrection. So simple, so straightforward. The answer of a good conscience toward God. That is what baptism is by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who's gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Mark chapter 16 and 16 says he that believeth and is baptized, shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. John chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16 says, And now why tarriest thou? Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what it said in Acts chapter 2. For the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why tarriest thou? Be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of of the Lord. Are you getting it? I, I move forward to 238 to show you it's the same words. It's the same actions. It's the same motions. God had a plan. And he would not allow man to step into the ways that would sever the doctrine of truth. Oh, my friend, everything that can sh be shaken, the Bible says, will be shaken, but heaven and earth, it'll pass away, but his word will not pass away. Nothing Jesus would not do. He would not yield ugh, to the devil. You ever heard the statement, the devil made me do it? We can blame it on somebody. We can blame it on something. But the decision and the choice is always ours. No way you can get beyond that statement. The choice is yours. Nobody can force you. Nobody can make you. No circumstances can cause it to happen Bottom line, it's always a matter of choice. Jesus would not yield to the devil. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 3 says, And when the tempter came to him. Now, can I tell you something? If the tempter is going to come to Jesus, even knowing who Jesus is, how much more is he going to come to you and I? Now, now, don't get this high and almighty thing about yourself. You see, there's only one devil, but there are many imps. The Bible calls them demons. There are the angels that fail, and 
There's one third of them that fell from heaven. And I don't have time to go into all of that, but it's the Bible. It's the word of God. And so there's principalities. There's powers. There's the rulers of the darkness of this world. There is spiritual wickedness in high places. That's Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, if you didn't know that. There are different orders of powers. And most of the time, the ones that come to you and I are just the little lowliest of them all. And that's what happens whenever there is temptation. Sure, there's temptation of the flesh. And there is temptation of the devil. But there is also just your own self-will that many times is the biggest culprit. But when the devil does come, let's see what happened with Jesus. He said, and when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Not by every word that mama said or that daddy said. Don't misunderstand me. We're to obey our fathers and mothers. Not every word that the government says and don't don't misunderstand me. The Bible is clear. We are to obey magistrates and them that have the rule over you. So we understand that is biblical, but it is not the thoughts of others. It's not the philosophy of others. It is not the theology of others. It is not the religion of others. It makes no difference how you were born. You need to be born again. It makes no difference how you live. You must live in not in the old ways, but as a new creation in Jesus Christ. And if you become a new creation in the Lord, guess what? You're going to have deliverance and hope and a change chance for the beauty of eternity with God. Amen. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and seeth setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. He pulled it straight out of Psalm 91. He went right into what the Word of God says. Did you know that the devil can pretty well quote the Bible? Have you ever figured it out yet that he probably knows the Bible better than you know it? And so he knows how, what is the word that we use in our day and time? Spin spin. You see something with your own eyes and then the media spins it and says, oh, don't believe your lying eyes. You ever heard that before? Don't believe your lying eyes. They spin it. Media spins it for what they want. And in like manner, that's the nature of man. You ever see two children playing and they both run up to the swing at the same time and there's only one swing? And they're both screaming to the top of their lungs, me first, me first, I got here first, mama, I got here first. And the other one's hollering, mama, no, 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 he's wrong, I got here first. Everybody from a little child learns to spin the truth. And that is the nature of humanity. That is the nature of 
fallen man. And don't think that the devil doesn't know that because he used it himself and he made it very clear that, hey, I can quote scripture too. He gave his angels charge concerning thee. And if you'll cast yourself down, you're not going to hurt yourself, Jesus. The angels will come and lift you up lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Notice the response of Jesus. Jesus said unto him, it is written again, line shall be upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. I quoted that exactly. It isn't just line upon line, but it's line upon line, line upon line. It's not just precept upon precept, but it's precept upon precept the second time. You don't have to worry. When you go to the Word of God, it's always concise. It's always direct. There is no confusion in the Word of God. You can read the entire Bible, and it is just as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago when it was written. Back during my college days and back whenever I taught in the university, I can still remember I would tell people things as if it were the accurate unchangeable truth whenever it came to some botanical term or some biological action. And I look back 40 something years ago and the very books that I taught out of in the university are now so out of place and some of the thoughts that I thought were just absolutes are now so different and so changed because modern science has moved on and figured out new things. Guess what my friend? When Jesus said it, it's all right. You can believe it because it's just as relevant today as it was back then. You don't have to redefine the Bible. You don't have to to change the Bible. You don't have to make it any different than what it was 2,000 years ago. There's no confusion. There's no chaos. There's no contradiction. One part of the Word doesn't contradict other parts of the Word. And so whenever it comes to scientific principles, and it looks like it's contradicting the Bible, forget that principle. Believe the Bible. Believe the Word of God. Believe this apostolic truth. Amen. And so whenever we see Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Enough for that because I want to have time to move a little bit farther into other things. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. And from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go up, go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him. Oh, wait a minute now. You're the Messiah. You're the Savior. You're going to have to die. No, no, no. You're, we're getting ready to set up a throne. We're going to build a throne. And we're going to set you on it. And you're going to be the king. And you're going to overrule Caesars. You're going to overrule all the governments of this earth. We're going to set up your kingdom. And we're going to be right in the middle of it. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Can you imagine? Here I am, an apostolic preacher. I'm so excited because I'm telling y'all all all these good things that God's going to do. And then all of a sudden, the very one I worship, the very one I serve, looks at me and says, Rick Pavlou, you get behind me, 
Satan. Didn't just say, get behind me. He said, do you understand where this spirit's coming from, Simon Peter? Do you understand? The devil doesn't want me to go to Calvary. The devil doesn't want me to die for the sins of the world. The devil doesn't want me to have stripes on my back so that all those may be healed. For by his stripes, we're healed. The devil doesn't want that. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. We have to be so careful that we don't allow, again, as I said from the beginning, our will to overrule God's will. Another thing Jesus would not do, he would not be moved by flattery. Mm. Where are we going with this, Brother Pavlou? What's this all about? Hey, babe, you're so sweet and so nice, and I love you so much. And you know that favorite meal of mine? Yeah, I've worked hard. I've worked in the yard. I've done all these. I, I took the garbage out twice today. Of course, you took it out three times. I've, I've done all these things for you. Hey, babe, would, would you make me my favorite meal? <laughs> Sometimes flattery doesn't work. By the way, I've been married to that beautiful, sweet lady for 49 years, going on 50 years. Oh, and she gets sweeter every day. If it's possible, I don't know if it is, but as beautiful as she was when I courted her and when I married her, She's actually prettier today. How's that possible? It's amazing. <laughs> Yo, uh, hey, I've got the microphone, babe. <laughs> I preach here and you preach at home. It works out well. <laughs> give an applause. Hey, you already did it, but give, give Sister Pavler an applause. Put up with me for 49 plus years. Wow. But Jesus would not be moved by flattery. John chapter 3 and verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The, came, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Now, he started off, you know, hey, you're great, you're amazing, now tell me what I want to know. And I want it to be what I want to know. Jesus wasn't moved by all that. Verse 3, it did not deviate him from anything he was going to say concerning the plan of salvation. Verse three, Jesus answered and said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus didn't deviate. You know, when someone came to me and started telling me how nice looking I am and how kind I am and how sweet I am. Of course, at my age, I begin to say, really, what's going on here? <laughs> what? I already got your number, sir. I already got your number, ma'am. Okay, what do you want? 
That's the next thought in my mind. But Jesus didn't deviate from it. He could call him a teacher. He could call him rabbi. He could talk about the miracles that you do because I know God's got to be with you. And Jesus, just straightforward, you must be born again. You must be born of the water and of the Spirit. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 16, it says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may, in, that I may have eternal life? What, what a way to start. Good master, what good things shall I do? And he said unto him, Why do you call me good? Why are you trying to, you know, flatter me? There's none good but one. That is God. But if thou will enter into life, keep the commandments. We must be obedient to God. We must be obedient to his word. We can go into prayer and say, Lord, you're great, you're wonderful, and I know I'm doing all these things wrong, but you're so great and wonderful. Just kind of overlook all that. No, flattery will get you nowhere with God. We must obey his word. Amen, somebody. Am I running out of time? Ooh, yeah. Let's see. We got all day except for two minutes. I'm going to jump real quick. Media guys, here's where I'm going. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Look at that. They got it just like that. Let's give an applaud to the media. <laughs> Guys and girls, I can't see that good up there, so I'm just going to shoot out in the dark and hope to hit the right pronoun. Oop, don't go there, Rick Pavlin. <laughs> don't go there. Luke chapter 9, verse 51, real quick. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up to Mount Jesus, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He didn't lose sight of his goal. Did you know that Jesus knew what awaited him in Jerusalem? Now remember, Jesus is all God, but he's all man. And in his humanity, he knew there was going to be death and suffering and struggle and pain. He knew that he would struggle so intently with that cross that they would have to get someone to help him carry it the last steps of the way up to Golgotha. He knew that. But also as God, he knew there had to be a sacrifice. He knew there had to be the shedding of spotless, sinless blood that would cover the sins of this world. And so the Bible in such amazing terms said he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. I like the way Hebrews chapter 12 puts it. It says in Hebrews 12 verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured it. He despised the shame. What, that doesn't sound like joy to me. But Jesus looked far beyond Calvary. 
He looked far beyond 2,000 years ago. He looked to Church Point, Louisiana, to a church called Point Church. And he looked to you and you and you and you and you. And he said, there's the joy. Calvary is going to be painful. The cross is going to be harsh. Suffering and agony and death is not pleasant. But there's a joy beyond the cross. There's a joy beyond Calvary. There's a church of the living God that there's going to be those that love me, that are going to live for me because I died on the cross of Calvary for them. Shall we stand this morning? Oh, what an honor. What a privilege to enter into his presence. And oh, can I tell you once again what I said last week. I'm so glad there's a rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. There's a refreshing. If you're ever having problems, you're ever struggling, come to Jesus. You ever feel sadness and sorrow and grief, come to Jesus. He'll give you rest. I said, he'll give you rest. There yet remaineth a rest. And you and I entered in whenever we received the Holy Ghost. And he said, in prophecy, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. Oh, my friend, can I tell you, you have found that rest. You have found what the Sabbath is all about. That is the rest that will lead you into eternity when you see him face to face. On that day, you shall be like him for you shall see him as he really is. Yeah, you say, but Brother Pavley, you don't know what I'm going through. I don't. But I know a God that died for you. Say, you don't know how much I'm struggling and the pain I've got. But I know a God that died that you might have rest and that you might have refreshing. I wonder if we could all step to the front, as is our tradition. I wonder if we could just all recognize in our own hearts that God had a plan for me. Not just for a church body, not just for the first service at Point Church or the second church service when the other group will be here. Not just for a group of people. Not just for a crowd. But Jesus had a plan for you as an individual. Forget about everybody around you. For you, he died. For you, he allowed stripes on his back. No matter what you're going through, no matter what pain you're facing, no matter what struggle you're going through right now, there is a rest. There is a refreshing. Enter. See, that's your part. Enter. Remember what I said from the very beginning? You thought I was kind of saying it out of course. I said it all goes back to a choice. You got to choose. You choose to enter. Some of you don't understand. I'm facing alcohol issues. I'm facing drug issues. I'm facing family issues. I'm facing marriage issues. Join the human race. But don't set up a tent and live there. Because God has a habitation for you. A new dwelling place. Enter into his rest. Oh, shall we pray right now? Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your goodness and your kindness toward us who believe. We thank you for this great privilege 
of entering in to your divine and eternal presence. Lord, even in this world, we know it's all going to pass away. All of this earth and this world is going to pass away. But we're entering into your rest. And we're stepping into eternity with you. And we're soon to see you face to face. Thank you for the privilege of being a child of God. Thank you for providing for us, God, and giving us a way when there was no way. We love you. We thank you. We give you the glory and all the praise. Let's worship him as Sister Jen sings, and let's continue to give the Lord praise. Thanks for joining our online worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and your family. We would love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, or you can go to www.point.church and connect with us there. If you'd like to partner with us in giving, you can download our app, or you could go to point.church and click give. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to worshiping with you again soon.